Hello YouTubes, welcome back to Telly's Marine Tales. My name is Chantel, I'm a marine biologist, and on this channel we talk about all things ocean and science related, but I wanted to start bringing in content that was a little bit more fun and entertaining, so that's why I decided to do something very different and do this reaction to Finding Dory. Um, it's a Friday afternoon for me right now, late afternoon. I've had a busy week, the weather's really icky, it's all overcast and rainy and not a great day, so it's the perfect afternoon for a movie afternoon. So I'm looking forward to just chilling out with you, um, watching Finding Dory. I have some mint tea ready on the go. I'm in my comfy clothes, as you can see, hala weekend. So yeah, we're just gonna chill out, watch some Finding Dory together. I'm gonna bring in a little bit of science here and there. There are one or two things about this movie that really frustrate me, um, which I'll get into, but overall I love it. I'm looking forward to watching it with you. I do know that uh, Maria, my friend from the CNME channel, has also done a reaction to Finding Dory. She did it a while ago. I haven't watched that. Um, I didn't want to bias myself in doing this reaction. So I'm going to film this and then I'm actually going to go watch her reaction to Finding Dory and see how similar our responses are will be quite interesting i think so yeah we're gonna get into it watch some finding dory get some tea get some comfy clothes on and let's get into it all right here we go um so i don't know about you guys but i actually really enjoyed finding nemo um and you know sometimes sequels can't be that great but I actually enjoyed Finding Dory more than I enjoyed Finding Nemo. I think this is my favorite ocean movie. No, no, wait, I have to preface that. I love Moana. It's Thai with Moana. Finding Dory and Moana, to me, are like my top two favorite ocean movies. I don't know which one I prefer more. What do you guys think? And leave it down in the comments below. Do you prefer Finding Dory, Finding Nemo? Um, Moana, or do you prefer like those horrible shark movies? I hate them. Or, oh my gosh, cute little Dory. Hang on. That's exactly what you say. Okay, okay. We'll pretend to be the other kids now. I mean, you physically can't get a cuter fish than baby Dory. And <laughs> that laugh, I love it. Hi, I lost my family. Can you help me? Where did you see them last? Well, uh. So this whole montage of like. Dory going off finding, trying to find her family, traversing through different ocean ecosystems. I mean, it's obviously unrealistic. This is an animation, so we have to take it, everything with a pinch of salt. But overall, reef fish, especially small reef fish that occur on coral reefs, they don't move around much. Um, things like clownfish, they have their own anemone that's their anemone and it's their home and they don't really leave it that much. And I think even to the certain extent, the blue tang, which is what Dory is, they really don't travel that far. They kind of stick to certain areas of coral reefs. So, I mean, yeah, Dory and, and Marlin going across the whole, whole ocean looking for things, it's a bit unrealistic, but you know what? It's fine. Adds an element of excitement to the movie. We'll go with it. <gasps> Mr. Ray! I couldn't actually remember if we saw Mr. Ray in this movie. I'm so excited. Days the day. Days the day. Real trip to the stingray migration. Stingray migration. How does anyone know why we migrate? Stingray migrate? migration. Isn't that this is one of my favorite parts of this Daddy movie. I study stingrays and I study stingray movement patterns. So this is like what I study. This is very exciting. Migration is about going home, home, which is where you're from. Where you're from. Can someone tell me where they're from? I would like to I've actually back. just this week or a couple of weeks ago. I'm analyzing some stingray movement data and I've identified some migration patterns along the South African coastline, which is really, really exciting. It's the first time we've seen it in South Africa, so whoop whoop. Love each other. And we'll stop right there. <laughs> I'm aboard explorers. I feel a migration song coming on. Oh, <laughs> I'd love to have a picture of that song. <laughs> Here they come, here they come, the stingrays are coming. Oh, I'd love to see this in real life, like a full-on fever. Oh, look, they're singing too. Oh, I literally have goosebumps. It's literally one of my life dreams 
to see these big schools of stingrays. You get, um, I think it's cow nose rays in 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 California or in the bay. Um, what's that bay called? There by Mexico, that big bay. Oh, I can't remember. But they have like these huge schools of cow nose rays that pass through there. It's like all I want to see one day. Actually, Mr. Ray, I think he's a spotted eagle ray. I think that's what they modeled him after. And um, they are rays that can occur like alone in solitary or they can occur in groups. Um, so I just, I mean, I've seen rays by themselves, but I'd love to see a big group of them. See, so the fact that Marlin doesn't want to travel, that's quite realistic because these reef fish do not want to leave the reef. It is dangerous out there. There's lots of fish out there that's going to eat them. Um, so they have these really small home ranges. They stick to the areas they know. They stick to their little corals or their little anemones, and they do not travel much. So this whole uh, turtle migration thing is also pretty accurate. Um, I mean, obviously them riding the currents, I don't think is going to be as intense as they show it, but um, they do travel crazy distances. So there was a turtle that they had in the Two Oceans Aquarium, which is the aquarium here by me in Cape Town. Um, and you know, she, I think she came in injured and she had been in the aquarium for years. Her name was Yoshi. I actually dived with her, it was really cool. But um, they, she started exhibiting nesting behavior in the aquarium. So they wanted to like release her and give her a chance to be free and live her life. Um, but before they released her, they actually put a little tag on her, a satellite tag, so they could track her movements. And for a while she stuck around Africa and then she went up the other side, the western side of, of South Africa and I think she went all the way up to Namibia, maybe even Angola. I'll double check the track for you. But now she trekked the entire way across the whole Indian Ocean all the way to um, Australia. Um, so they do travel crazy distances. I mean I'll have to check for you but that's a whole ocean basin that she crossed. Um, and she will have used ocean currents to facilitate this movement. Um, and unfortunately, so she made it to Australia, but her tag battery died. I think it was a three-year tag battery. So we don't know what's happened to her now, but I hope she's found her home. I hope she's made her home with migration and she's gonna find a mate and lay some eggs in Australia. At least that's the hope. So this is also quite accurate, the fact that fish get stuck in plastic. Um, I don't know how often that happens to fish, but all kinds of marine life get entangled in plastic, from seabirds to turtles to you name it, whether it's pieces of plastic floating around, whether it's old fisher nets that are just floating around in the ocean. There's so much marine wildlife that gets entangled in ocean plastic, it's actually really sad. One of the things they suggest that you do is if you have any plastic, like for instance, like what's wrapped around Dory now, where it's a ring, that you just cut the ring before you get rid of the plastic so that it doesn't get entangled like that around, around sea life. What if it's a restaurant? Hey, you two, shut it. Yeah, we're trying to sleep. You interrupted my fate. So they're actually now in a kelp forest ecosystem, um, which definitely will not be a good place for them to be because coral reefs happen in nice warm clear waters um, above 25 degrees generally and kelp forests where I come from in Cape Town we also have kelp forests here are much colder so they kelp forests thrive in cold nutrient rich water but yeah so it's gonna that water is gonna be about maybe so anywhere between 8 to 15 degrees Celsius which is like a minimum of 10 degrees lower than what uh, <laughs> clownfish usually live in so yeah no we're not gonna have clownfish in cold forests but you will get seals we have Cape Verde seals here and they're actually really really fun to dive with because they're like they're called the dogs of the sea because they're super playful and um, you can actually like throw pieces of kelp for them and they'll go chase after the kelp and um, I've dived with them here. They're actually really, really cool to dive with. They're not as dumb as what this show makes them out to be. <laughs> so this whole storyline with the octopus escaping is actually also super realistic. Um, octopuses are notoriously difficult to keep in aquariums because they just, they're super clever 
and they're also super flexible they can like squeeze and shift themselves into any sort of shape that they want so um, the only hard part of an octopus is its beak which is like in between all of those tentacles underneath its head and that's what it uses to eat with and it's the only hard part um, so as long as its beak can squeeze through a hole the rest of the octopus can squeeze through a hole so um, unless you have your aquarium literally like airtight there's no places for it to get out it will get out and escape there's some really fun stories I actually encourage you to like google it online about you know these octopus escape artists and this this octopus Hank he's one of my favorite characters in this whole series he's really funny I think I might have found that and they are really um, good camouflage artists, but I don't think they're that good at camouflage, like turning yellow and into a pole. Mm, I don't think that's going to happen, but they do, they are very good at, uh, at camouflage and they can, they can even like change the shape of their skin so they can make it their skin flat or they can create like these tiny little nodules on their skin to look like kelp or, or something. So it's not only the color, but it's the texture of the skin that they can change, which is very cool. Okay, so this is one of my major complaints with one of the very few major complaints of this movie is the whole destiny thing. Okay, so she is a whale shark and a whale shark is a shark. It's actually the biggest shark, the biggest fish in the ocean. It's not a whale. Um, so why would destiny be able to speak whale to Dory? That makes no sense to me. Um, and they say she's nearsighted. Um, which, I mean, I don't actually know much about whale shark sight. They do have these tiny little eyes, so it wouldn't surprise me if they have pretty poor eyesight. They're quite funny looking, actually. But um, if she were a whale, she would be able to echolocate, like this little... Uh, oh, what's his name? What's that whale? I can't remember. Anyway, so he's a proper whale, so he can echolocate. He's a toothed whale. Um, and he can send out sound signals and they bounce back to him and he can see his environment in that way. Um, Destiny is not a whale, so she can't echolocate, so that's why she can't find her way in her surroundings. So I don't know why why they went with the storyline where she could speak whale and they kind of make her out to be a little bit of a whale. Um, she's a shark. She's 100% a shark and will not be able to speak whale. Mm -mm -mm. Sorry folks, we had to take a quick intercession to grab some popcorn. Mm, we'll carry on. So, another thing I don't quite understand about this movie okay, is why Dory is part of the open ocean exhibit. As far as I understand, I mean I could be wrong, but as far as I understand, this is what I checked, is that Blue tangs are a coral reef fish. They hang out on coral reefs. And the open ocean, again, as far as I understand, is like areas of the ocean where there's nothing around. It's just like the big gold blue. So why would a reef fish be in the open ocean? Not 100% sure. Um, yeah, that's something that's also, also always confused me about this movie. Actually, I just sort of something. Maybe they're using a sea mount as an ecosystem. So a sea mount is basically like like a huge mountain um, that comes up from the middle of the ocean. So there's nothing around it. It's this mountain that comes up to the surface. And because it goes so far up, like near the surface of the ocean, there's a lot of sunlight. So it can be a lot of coral reefs and a lot of life around these sea mounts. So it kind of seems like this is some sort of sea mount that comes up out of the open ocean. So that makes a little bit of sense. Oh, there we go. The beluga whale's name is Bailey. I don't know how I got back. My bunny's name is Bailey. But see, he's doing the echolocation thing. Well, he's trying to. So he sends out high, high-pitched signals of noise and he can make out his surroundings. It's actually a very cool way to like picture echolocation. So fun fact about whales, actually, you get two different types of whales. You get toothed whales, which is what the beluga is, um, and they use um, their teeth and their tongue to make noises and to make these echolocation noises. So it's only toothed whales that can echolocate. Whereas you get baleen whales, 
which don't have teeth, but they have this special structure called baleen, which is what they use to filter out the food out of their water. Um, <laughs> sorry. So, um, yeah, baleen whales, they don't have teeth. And as far as I'm aware, scientists still aren't exactly sure how they make noises, but they do make noises. And the humpback whale is a specific type of baleen whale. And um, they have these super complex songs, so they sing, the males at least, sing these beautiful mating songs to these females, and they're like these long complex songs. So this is actually like an incredible structure that Dory's parents have managed to make for her. Um, and while it's not um, documented that blue tangs make structures like these, there is a fish, um, I think it's the Japanese puffer fish, that makes these incredible underwater, I mean, there's no other word for it other than sculpture. Oh, look, she's found her parents. Oh my gosh, sorry. This is lovely. <laughs> oh, isn't that cute? I'm sorry, I'm a sucker for cute endings. But um, yeah, so these Japanese puffer fish, the male, makes these crazy underwater sculptures. So he spends Oh gosh, it's over a week. I, th I think it's about a week making this underwater sculpture and he like puffs away the sand and, and I'll show you a picture and he makes like all these divots and then he decorates it with shells so that the female fish can find it and she can lay her eggs in the center of this huge structure. But I mean the puffer fish, I think it's quite small, but he makes the structure like two meters big and he spends this whole week making this incredible structure. Um, and as far as I know, that's the only fish they found to make such a like, and it's mathematically perfect. It's like circular with all of these angles. I mean, it's just incredible. But it's the only fish that they found to make these um, these like underwater structures, as far as I know, at least in such a scale. Um, they actually very recently just discovered another one of these. They call them underwater crop circles down in Australia. So these were originally found in Japan. Um, and these, a new one was found in the deep sea in Australia, 100 meters down. They were doing a survey there. And it's quite interesting because pufferfish aren't really known to occur that deep. So they did see a pufferfish there, but it was too, it moved too quickly for them to identify it. So there are these new puffer circles that they've discovered in Australia, but they don't know if it's the same species as the one in Japan, if it's a different species, if it's a completely new species. It's quite exciting. So we're going to see what comes out of that. Remembered in your own amazing Dory way. I mean, this is a little bit ridiculous, but otters are super cute and they're actually really important components in kelp ecosystems. Um, I don't know if they cuddle exactly, but they do hold hands um, if you've ever seen them. Super cute. Another one of the animals I really want to see in the wild one day. Oh, so many like family reunions in this movie, it's just lovely. <laughs> Cutest laugh! Oh my gosh. Guys, you can do whatever you want with your life. That's what I love about this movie. Don't let anything hold you back. Find a crazy friend to do it with though. Someone like Hank makes it much better. Well, that's it, that's Finding Dory. Oh, I love the movie. I'm a big animation fan in general and when they do it good, oh, I just love it. So yeah, that, that was it, that was Finding Dory. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Let me know what you thought of this movie, if you liked it, if you didn't like it, it was just something new I thought I'd try. As I say, Maria's done once, so I'm actually going to go watch it now to see what she said. And um, yeah, let me know if you want to do another react, maybe a, one with Moana that's not as like science-y, but still ocean-y, one of my fave movies as I said before. Um, yeah, until next time, uh, enjoy your day, enjoy watching some movies, cuddling up, snuggling, and um, yeah, have a great day.